save the best to last. Let me just tell you uh, how things are going to pan out. This is a kind of, I was going to say a game of two halves, but it's really a game of three halves. That's what growing the pie looks like, right? Uh, we're going to have one session with the Taxpayers Alliance, uh, one session with me, and then some questions from the floor. That's how this in conversation is going to work. So please give a very, very warm welcome to John O'Connell, the Chief Executive of the Taxpayers Alliance, and our new Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Right Honourable Kwasi Kwarteng. Uh, Chancellor, I'll just echo Mark's thanks um, in you joining us this afternoon. Um, I'll kick straight off with questions since we're pushed for time. Um, after the reversal of the additional rate cut, is the government firmly committed to the other tax changes um, that were announced in the mini-budget, especially for us, the cut in the basic rate, which of course will have an impact for millions of taxpayers across the country? The basic rate is absolutely going to cut forward in terms of the one big cut. Uh, and that gives an average of £170 pounds, uh, to normal people, uh, ordinary, hard-working Oh, sorry about this. Can, I, can we just sort out the mic? Is the mic sorted? Let's check in. Protests are coming up, so we have Okay, so I'm going to do this. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Brilliant. No, the 1P uh, basic rate, that's what I think one of the most important measures, bring that forward a year, is absolutely something that we think is uh, the right thing to do. Okay. And um, do you feel that some of the reaction to the tax changes announced in the mini-budget were part of the so-called treasury mindset in action? No, not at all. I think uh, markets uh, acted in the way they did. There was a, a global context as well. The high dollar uh, was an issue. There was a sell-off in treasury uh, bonds, 10-year uh, uh, bonds last week. Um, and I think we're very, very focused on trying to bet in uh, the tax cuts that we announced. Um, but that's, that's, that's where we are. And I think, uh, well, yeah. No, I, I was just going to add, um, what can we do to shift the general conversation and mindset to a more pro-growth um, agenda? I think we already have. I mean, I think what I've been struck by the last 10 days is that everyone's talking about growth. And everyone's talking about, they're talking about the plan, they're talking about, uh, not everyone agrees uh, with some of the elements of the plan, but everyone's talking about growth. Everyone's talking about how we can try and reduce uh, some of the burdens we have. Uh, what I was very clear about coming into office was that uh, we had a 70-year high tax uh, burden and we were going into a, a year where the IMF predicted we would have the lowest growth in the G7. So clearly the road we were on where we were raising taxes and facing low growth uh, was unsustainable. And we had to shift the dial on that. And the measures that we announced, they weren't just about tax. There was lots of supply side, investment zones, uh, uh, measures that actually attract uh, capital. So something like the annual investment allowance. I pegged that at a million pounds. It was due to fall to 200,000 pounds. There was a whole range of policies about the enterprise investment scheme, uh, uh, the seed enterprise investment scheme. There were lots and lots of uh, pro-growth measures, capital attracting measures to the UK, and that's what I was very focused on. And, and that was under the umbrella of a focus uh, on growth. Well, far be it from, from the TPA to suggest the creation of a new Quango, but it has been suggested in um, previous few months about something like an office for economic growth. Do, do you think something like that could help shift the dial on, on getting away from that um, distributional and treasury mindset? Well, look, I think the treasury is a first class institution. And uh, I've found in the month that I've worked with uh, officials there, very, very good, hardworking uh, uh, and smart people. And I think what we're trying to do is to, is to get the, the, our treasury, which is a great institution, to think more about growth. And I think we're already doing that. Um, and there's a great willingness as well uh, among treasury officials. We've got excellent uh, people who are focused on growth. And I think they're doing a good job. And I, I want the treasury to be not only a good finance ministry, but a good economic growth ministry as well. I think that's vitally important. And um, I, I, there's been obviously a lot of talk about particular tax measures, but there's, there's a whole other bunch of taxes um, with high marginal rates. Sort of, um, you know, the, the salaries just above 100,000, know, the, the withdrawal rates from universal credit. There's a whole bunch of other high marginal tax rates within the system. Is that something that ought to be tackled in the media? Well, I've said that we're going to have a tax review precisely to deal with some of these anomalies. I mean, the way the tax system has built up is over decades. 
Um, and I think it makes sense, you know, once in a while to have a review of, of, of tax. Now, what I'm not going to do is tell you exactly which particular taxes, you know, are going to be uh, uh, reviewed. The whole thing uh, is going to be looked at. But for now, we need to bed in the, the growth plan. And I think there's some exciting measures in it. Um, in yesterday's speech, you, you said very welcomely, um, I am unashamedly a pro-business conservative. Now, the TPA, of course, campaigns all across the country, and the minute that we leave the M25, there's one issue that comes up more than any other, and it's business rates. Um, is that something that the government will look at as part of that review too? Um, as I, when I was base secretary, business rates came up a lot, and now that's one of the reasons why I want to look at the, uh, have a tax review. I'm not going to say anything more specific than that. I announced the tax review in the, in the mini-budget. Mm -hmm. As far as the speech was concerned yesterday, it was pro-growth. Um, I'm a pro-business conservative. I think businesses work uh, with families and individuals. I mean, those, those are the people who, em who are employed by businesses. I don't see a contrast or a conflict uh, in, 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 in the kind of Marxist way, class conflict way, between b business and individuals. I think in Britain, uh, many, most of us actually work in, in businesses, and I think businesses need to do well for the, uh, for the country uh, to do well economically. And if, if we looked elsewhere around the world or back through time as you're an ec economic historian, are, do, do you sense that there's a, a better way of taxing business than we currently do um, through business rates, corporation tax and, and other measures like that? As I've said, I'm committed to a tax review. Um, and I want to lower the burdens on business. And we did that in the growth plan. I mean, if you looked at, if you speak to the FSB or even the CBI or the IOD, they welcomed lots of the measures in the mini budget because we were, we were increasing or not decreasing the uh, investment allowance. We had a lot of, um, uh, we extended the EIS. There was doubt about how long the EIS would, would last. We've extended that. Uh, we, uh, the, the national insurance uh, reverse. Uh, of the increase, uh, they welcome that because that's a, 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 the employers have to pay national insurance, um, and there were lots of measures in the growth plan that was welcome that were welcomed by business, and I'm really really uh, grateful for that, and and a lot of that came from my experience as base secretary because I was talking to these groups all the time. Um, just to move to the other side of the ledger, spending. Um, why do you think it is that a £10 billion tax cut is more difficult to get through than a £10 billion spending increase? Um, a tax cut is more difficult. To, I, I think spending, um, we've set, what I say about spending is that we've got a comprehensive spending review, which was set at the end of 2021. And that's very much the, the envelope that I want to work uh, within. And I think, you know, if you look at COVID, you look at the energy intervention, I mean, nobody's talking about the energy intervention, but that was a huge... Uh, use of balance sheet to help people and people were facing uh, bills potentially of six thousand five hundred pounds next year and we've intervened and said you know there's going to be a limit to two thousand five hundred pounds that's a huge intervention and I think that um, you know we have we have used spending to protect to protect people um, and I think we should uh, you know we're, no, we're, we're committed uh, to having great public services but the way to get great public services is actually by growing the economy because it's by growing the economy that you get higher tax receipts, which can pay for better public services. And I remember David Cameron used to make that argument, and he was right. So um, a lot of the work that the OBR does and the Treasury does, rightly for many reasons, looks at um, what happens to receipts when you change um, tax measures. Some of the work that we've been doing um, tr tries to look at tax changes in a different way, dynamically, yeah. so their effects on long-term growth. Sure. Is that something that the Treasury ought to embrace themselves? Well, look, I, mean, I think I remember with, uh, when George Osborne was Chancellor, he was interested in those ideas. And I think, I think some form of dynamic modelling is, is interesting. I mean, it's, it, it helps you understand what the actual, uh, as you say, the, the, the trajectory mm. of the policy is. Um, and I think that uh, there's, you know, there's work that people can do in that area. And, and just to jump straight back to spending. I know you, you mentioned that there's a, a spending review coming up and um, you, you won't go into specifics. Well, it's, all, it's already happened, the spending review. Right. So the CSR has already it, happened. As in, um, you're and not, yeah. and that you won't go into specifics, but what are sort of the guiding principles around that in, in terms of how you prioritise areas of spending and decisions on how you reallocate, reallocate money? Well, we've got a commitment to the uh, NHS. We've got a commitment to defence spending. I think the efficiencies under um, Boris Johnson, it, what he was talking about, uh, trying to find efficiencies within government. That's something that we should be doing. But we should be relentlessly looking at 
um, how we can make government more efficient. I mean, any business would be doing that. Um, people in their households are looking at how they can um, you know, run their households more efficiently, more effectively. And I think we have a moral duty as custodians of the public purse uh, to do that. So, as you know, the TPA has long campaigned on uh, issues on value for money and spending. And um, it can often be contentious when people come up with ideas for reducing spending. But at the same time, we, we, we get a sense that the public do understand that a government must live within its means. So is there a sort of one measure or one metric that we ought to be looking out for um, to gauge that this government is being fiscally responsible? So my, my principal um, understanding of this is about the growth of public uh, sector spending. And, and I think that one should try and keep it within the growth of the economy as a whole, tracking or lower. Because actually, if you look at the obverse, if you had a world, let's say, for 30 years where public spending was higher than economic growth, at the end of that period, you would essentially have a state that was engorging most of the, uh, most of the economy. I mean, that's just the logic of that, of that mathematics. So I think we do need to have a, a, a disciplined approach. Uh, but at the same time, we've got to recognize that we've got to fund public services. I mean, that's what a modern democratic uh, society would expect. And our fundamental argument on this is that we, do, we get the best services by growing the economy. Because it's by growing the economy that you get tax revenue to fund public services. And if you don't grow the economy, you find the pressures on spending are much more acute uh, than is the case if you do grow the economy effectively. And that's why I'm 100% focused on growth. So th th you're talking about funding public services. We'd agree that that's a very important thing to do. But there are other areas of spending that you know, several people at this conference, MPs, whoever else, have said that you know, they're, they're spending items where the government is involved in people's lives or in people's businesses where it ought not to be. Um, in your time in government, having dealt with quangos and these kinds of things, have you seen that firsthand? And, and if so, you know, where are those areas where the government's intruding into people's lives and businesses where it shouldn't? I think there's lots of uh, things. I mean, that's one of the reasons why uh, we've said in the, in the growth plan that we want to lower burdens on business. And it's in tax, but also regulation. If you look at IR35, that's, that, that was regulation mm -hmm. where, you know, we got, uh, I got lobbied on this all the time as a backbencher, as a junior minister. And again, that was an area where, you know, we were listening and we're trying to, you, trying to reduce those sorts of burdens on, on people who are essentially self-employed or operating in small businesses. And I think it's really important that as a chancellor and as a government, we are looking at, the, uh, at how we can help small uh, businesses, small enterprises, because that's the backbone of, 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 of our economy. So with growth as a watchword for spending as well as tax, um, does, does that imply that perhaps we might be seeing some more infrastructure spending instead of current spending? Or is, is, there, is there a rebalance? So needed? one of the most exciting things about the growth plan was the investment zones. I mean, the investment zones for me are incredibly exciting because they're areas where you can accelerate uh, uh, investment. They're areas which can benefit from not only tax uh, 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 breaks, but also uh, a slightly l lower regulatory uh, burden. And actually, the interest that I, I've seen, I've been going around Birmingham, people are interested, uh, you know, civic leaders in the investment zones. They find that really, really exciting. And I think that's a really good step. Uh, in the right direction. That's exactly what you're talking about in terms of not only attracting business investment through uh, uh, tax uh, reductions, but also through a, a lighter regulatory environment and those investment zones. It's all by mutual consent. No one's going to be forced into an investment zone, but people are asking, can we have an investment zone? And that's really, really attractive. Um, um, a, fi a final question for me. Um, so, so there, there, there seems to be quite a lot of low-hanging fruit with government spending, um, you know, particularly in areas that the TPA have done work on um, with uh, money going to organisations that then lobby against government policy, um, particularly in areas uh, on social policy and um, organisations that might under undermine British values, you could even say. Is that something that we can expect the government to take immediate action on? Well, we've said that we're going to look at government efficiencies. We've said we've looked at, at Whitehall. We've said uh, that we want to um, you know, streamline government. I don't quite know which organisations you might be talking about, but 
we, we, you know, we're taking, we're looking at everything in the round, obviously. Well, it's something that the TPA would be able to perhaps um, furnish you with more information on in that I process. look forward to it, okay. I'm sure. I've got a whole host of your papers. I'm yeah, sure I can excellent, excellent. rummage through them and find uh, where the, who the culprits are. Yeah. <laughs> Chancellor, thank you for your time from me. I'm going to hand over to Mark now. Thank you. Thank you. For joining us. Uh, I think it's almost three weeks to the hour since you became Chancellor of the Exchequer. There is that I think it's about four weeks. Four weeks? Is it long as that? Yeah, it's a long time. It's a long time. Uh, so it's what, Feels my, my first chance to actually congratulate no, you. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, how's it going? Very well. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's a unique privilege to have a job like the one I hold. And, you know, there are lots of pressures all the time. I mean, I remember as a, 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 a Bay's cabinet uh, minister. And there were a whole host of pressures. People forget that. I mean, we had the fuel duty. We had forecourt um, uh, issues. We had uh, energy price uh, spikes. Uh, we had energy interventions. We had um, the whole business of last year when a whole host of uh, energy companies had to leave the market. There are lots of, you know, in government, there are lots of things one has to deal with. Uh, and as chancellor, you know, the, there's more scrutiny. But there's, and there's, but it's a fascinating job. And actually, one of the things that I've really enjoyed about the job is not only speaking to you know, officials in the Treasury, but also speaking to the governor of the Bank of England, uh, who uh, is a Leicester uh, man. I don't know whether he's a Leicester football supporter, but he's, uh, he's very much embedded in Leicester. And we talk about uh, you know, the, the, the region. He's saying, how is Birmingham? He, you know, he spent a lot of time in his youth in Birmingham. And I think it's just brilliant to be able, in my position, to be able to talk to business leaders and, 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 and the governor of the bank and really learn and get a huge amount of experience uh, from other people's uh, professional, uh, their, their professional uh, learnings, their, 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 the lessons they've learned. Um, and also I bring all my experience as base secretary. Uh, and that's why I was very, very focused on growth because I was speaking to businesses all the time as base secretary. And I was very determined uh, once I got into the Treasury, to start thinking more uh, energetically about growth. Um, I'm now going to ask you for a favour, I think. This is for the benefit of some members of the assembled press. I wonder if you could just help me out here and confirm that the mini-budget was actually written by you and the government and not by the Institute of Economic Affairs. So the credit and the uh, blame is with you, not with us. Well, I, I think you're trying to disown uh, uh, it. Um, but no, no. Well, I mean, we, we were very favourable no, to no, large so, so the mini-budget, the thing about, about the... I'm very proud of it, because actually, when it was launched, the businesses were coming up to me and saying, this is great. This is the, people were saying, this is the first time in 20 years that a government is talking about being pro-growth, pro-business, and um, pro what we're trying to do in terms of creating jobs, creating wealth, and driving the country forward. And we're completely 100% behind that. So the, uh, I want you to help me on whether I've understood the philosophy of the, of the new government, which I'm very excited about. And if, 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 I'm right, if I'm right, there's sort of three tranches to it. One, and you mentioned this to John already, is tackling the tax burden, which you mentioned uh, on the floor of the House of Commons is you know, the highest since the tail end of the Clem Attlee government of, right. the, of the 1940s. 1951, yeah. Um, the second is uh, fiscal constraint, which needs yeah. to be found. I know I'm not, there's no point in me pressing on the details of that. We'll hear them on November the 23rd. And the third is deregulation, essentially. I mean, sometimes called supply-side reform to actually unlock yeah. the economy. That's the mixture. So... What do you think, if you like, gone wrong, let's say over the last 15 years, I guess, going back to the global financial crash? Really what mixture of things has been, you know, has made the UK... I mean, I know there have been crises, and you've indeed walked, you know, your, your new government faces sure. a crisis right now, but sure. what has systemically gone wrong since, say, 2008? Hey, look, I think what's happened in the last... Well, 2008, uh, there was a huge government... But, I mean, over the last 15, yeah, 20 and years I, as a whole. I, I think the last sort of... Let's start with the last three or four years... We spent a huge amount of money, as we should have done, and the response to that was that we've got to raise the money, as much money in tax. So we got into a position where we were spending uh, hundreds of billions, and then the view was, well, if we're going to spend hundreds of billions, we've got to raise the money in tax. And the logic of that got us to where we are, which I thought was unsustainable, where we were spending um, you know, billions and billions and billions and raising the money uh, in tax. And that led to a position where, as you said, you've got the 70-year high, and the IMS prediction in, in, in January, uh, sorry, in July, was that of the G7 countries, we were going to have the lowest growth. And I said, how can that be sustainable? How can we be in a situation where we've got a very, very high tax burden, 
and very low projected growth. Mm -hmm. And we had to somehow, um, you know, come off that trajectory. And that's, that's what we're doing. And, I mean, it's difficult to put a kind of ratio or a figure on this, I guess, Chancellor, but how much of you think it's been a tax problem? How much of it has just been creeping year after year? I mean, you, you go back decades, creeping red tape and regulation that just inch by inch, you know, gov government and regulators are just making it that little bit harder. There's no decisive point I can find that completely stymies the economy. But it, it's been likened to me a bit like standing on the edge of a river and throwing pebbles in. You know, not one pebble makes a particular difference. But if you keep There's regulating tightly, then, then it slows the flow. I think that's an, an element to it. But I mean, the, 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 the way, the reason why it's easier to talk about taxes that there are numbers yeah so when you when you look at the curve and you see the tax take of gdp the tax proportion uh, of gdp there's a is science it, is it a 70 year yeah. high yeah. and you think about what's happened in all those 70 years you can see that that's an issue and then when you look at the growth rate and you compare your trend growth rate now to 20 or 30 years ago you can see that's a problem as well and so that's one of the things that you have to solve and it's not something you're going to solve overnight. Um, and it does involve, you know, a transition. It does involve doing things differently. Yeah. But that's something, you know, in terms of our analysis that we were, we were very focused on. And I'm very pleased, actually, in, the, in a way, because people are now talking about growth. We don't all have the same ideas about growth, but we're talking about it. We're talking about how can we um, get the government to think more about growth. We're talking about, you know, what the, what the tax burden looks like. What, you know, how uh, we're going to fund yeah. our public services. And actually, you know, uh, the, the argument that you, you fund public services by getting good growth, a strong economy, is a really powerful argument that we need to make all the time. I, I mean, I think we at the IA are broadly delighted by this. A frustration of mine over the past 20 years has been that politicians of all stripes have treated kind of growth as a kind of exogenous act of God, you know, a number that the economy just sort of inherits. And sometimes it can be. A pandemic hits. There's the Ukraine crisis. There's the energy crisis. But... It is also a factor of public policy. And do you think that criticism's right? Politicians, this government's taking a different approach to it, but politicians have typically sort of seen the growth rate as something they just sort of inherit and have to work with, rather than something that public policy can change. I think you make a, you, you, you make a fair point in the sense that, um, you know, the pressures of government mean that you have to, you have to, you do have to tax and spend. You have to pay for services. You have to pay uh, for public goods. And the way we do that is through through tax, and we don't think, we haven't thought enough about how we can actually drive the growth that can pay for the public services. We're always in the year looking at how, and that's important. I mean, you've got to, you've got to have fiscal uh, uh, responsibility. But at the same time, you should take a step back and think, how do we, and, and the way I would put it is that you've got to enable the conditions of growth. I don't believe that government has a, has a button and says sure. growth, and then growth happens. I think what you have to do is create the conditions where people feel comfortable to invest in the UK, where small business people think that they can hire uh, an extra uh, worker or hire an apprentice, where people think who are in a job, they think, actually, I can go and set up my own business. Those are the conditions which a government uh, has, to, has to enable, and that's what the growth plan is all about. Go governments uh, probably do have a lot of buttons that they can press and indeed historically have pressed though that stymie growth, right? I mean, I, I bet you wish you had a magic lever that could immediately get us to 2.5%, but part of it is almost taking a kind of Hippocratic oath, isn't it? You know, sort of first do no harm. And there's been an awful lot of government intervention over, I'm not blaming just the previous administration, it's just become the consensus of British politics that more and more interventions occur. Yeah. I mean, look, I, th I think the interventions have been necessary. I mean, I think, you know, you're faced with a global pandemic uh, such as COVID, the response around the world. We had to intervene. But in our intervention, we also had to think about how we can actually not only have long-term resilience, but how we can actually grow uh, our economy. And that's the balance, I think, that politicians, people in positions like mine, need to think about. And actually, this is something that is happening all over the world. It's not something that we're only dealing with in Britain, I mean, you look at um, you know what's happening in in America, uh, the Inflation Reduction Action. I mean, that's huge uh, government spending, and you know the Fed is raising rates as well. You know, so there, there's there's that there's those dynamics too, and we have to think, I think, more broadly about how we can drive growth uh, in the economy, and that's why, with the supply side regulatory measures, and also you know targeted uh, tax alleviations for business. I think we can get we can get this engine uh, going. 
I want to pick up where John left on the, the spending side of the ledger. And I'm not going to do what the mainstream media do, which is to sit you down and ask you to reveal your November the 23rd statement in advance. I'm That's pointless that. and it's boring. But I'm interested in getting inside your head about how you're going to approach the problem of fiscal constraint. Um, you know, what, what would be the sort of things you're looking at to try and find savings? Um, are you a bit worried? I mean, I know this government has made some pledges and inherited some pledges, but vast arrays of government spending are kind of sacrosanct, either politically or indeed by policy commitment, X percent on this, Y percent on that. How are you going to approach, you know, finding the savings that you need to make on the spending side of the ledger to give confidence, I guess, to the markets, but also to the public that over the medium term this comes right, even though, you know, nobody's expecting a balanced budget, you know, this year, given the, given the crisis. But what's, what's the mindset? What's the kind of meta approach to that rather than a list of numbers where so you might I, find savings? I think savings? it's really important that we uh, stick to the comprehensive spending review that was announced in 2021, and I'm writing to departments saying uh, where, you know, where they can find uh, efficiencies. I'm also very, very keen uh, that we do make spending commitments uh, to help, to, to help defence, uh, and also I think we do have an obligation to, to, to help vulnerable people, and that's why uh, the energy intervention was so critical. Uh, you know, we've had the, um, uh, the energy uh, 400 pounds uh, payment, we've got the uh, energy intervention on the sort of essentially limiting uh, bills to £2,500. Yeah. You know, we are, we are helping uh, people in our society. I think that's really, really important. You know, and, and I see... There was a phrase about 20 years ago, compassionate conservatism. I, I've always been someone drawn to that. Um, and my own personal background is my, my mother was in the Methodist Church, so that's something which uh, has always, is, still is in the Methodist Church. That is something that's al always been part of my, my DNA. Um, and I think with, but within the spending envelope, I think we, we've got to try and look. It's a moral duty for us to be good custodians of, of public money. It's not our money. That's what you were, you yeah. were telling me for years. Yeah. It's not the government's money. It's not politicians' money. It's, 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 it's the people's money. It's, uh, and we, ra we raise it through tax. And if we do that, we have a moral obligation to make sure that we, 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 we look after that. Money. And you, you were ref referencing the, uh, the Cameron and Osborne administration a bit. I mean, in recent years, especially since 2015, uh, public sector spending has enormously outstripped growth. I think, as, as the new government rightly analyzes, if you can get growth up, you can obviously get the public That's sector right. spending up uh, uh, alongside that. But do you think we should be, in very broad terms, not looking for a policy commitment here, trying to get back to something like the David Cameron, uh, not quite commitment, but analysis that the, growth, the, the proceeds of growth should be shared? That you know, if you're able to get it, I know your target's 2.5%. I want to come on to that in a moment. But it, let's, let's say that you were to smash your target. I'm sure you will. It gets to 3 or 4%. Okay, well, now public spending could have gone up uh, on the sort of trajectory it has. But if it falls, then the public sector should also take part of the hit. And we've sort of allowed the public sector not to take the hit when growth has been woefully poor? Look, so I think we've got a measure of commitments. You know, we've got the commitments in defence, we've got commitments in health, we've got commitments across the whole public sector. So I'm, I'm very keen to protect that. But as a principle, and it, it, you know, I think the public, if you get a sustained period where public sector spending is, is growing much faster than economic growth, you end up in a socialist state. Mm -hmm. You know, if over 30 years in every year, the public sector spending is going faster than uh, the rate of growth. The logic of that over time is, is a, a state which engorges the, you know, way more than 60, 70% of the economy. And I don't think many people want, want to, to see get that. that. No. So you do have to think in, in terms of public spending. But as you say, if you can grow the economy at 3 or 4%, that gives you a lot more width uh, to, to, to have really great public services. I just want to touch a bit on the energy package. As you, I don't know whether you know or not, the IEA was somewhat critical of it. I don't envy you the, the position you inherited. It had a lengthy leadership election where you know, it was difficult to make exact policy. I kind of get the government's approach. We're going to launch this huge bazooka. It's not just actually an economic problem. I think we were quite close to business centers and families, not just worried, in a state of panic, yeah. uh, actually. That, uh, and I've got the luxury of not, you know, not being an elected politician, not having to make the uh, decisions. So I get you've launched this huge bazooka as, and hopefully the energy position unwinds. Do you think there's possibly a bit too much welfare at the top? I understand that you know we're, we're subsidizing, let's say, all domestic energy. I mean, if you're a very high energy user because you live in a huge house with eight bedrooms and an indoor swimming pool, should all of it really be subsidized? I think, I think we state? had to act at speed. And I think the best approach is to have a universal approach to this. Because once you say, okay, we're not going to have a universal approach, where do you draw the lines? 
you know, who, who you know. Well, let's say we'll only subsidise the first 10,000 or 8,000 of your domestic energy bill. If you're going beyond that, that would be a, a very sure sign that you're an affluent household. So everybody gets their first 8,000 subsidised for sake of I'm picking a number at random. Sure. But, and then beyond that, if you want to, you know, right, many, many, many bedrooms, so, well, now so, you're paying market rate. So in actual, uh, you know, this was the biggest problem that we were facing. Yep. And I think we acted very, very fast. And it was a shame that it was overshadowed by, you know, more sadder events that we, we've all mm. lived through in terms of the transition, the new monarch, uh, and, and, and the sad passing of uh, Her Late Majesty. Um, but actually the announcement was made uh, very, very soon after we came into office. And I think it was absolutely the right thing because people were worried, people were scared, uh, and the numbers were, were eye-popping. And I, I think in order to deal with that very quickly, we had to have a simple plan and, and a simple uh, uh, approach. And I think the approach that we did was, was simple. I think if you start trying to taper things, and you know, it, does get, it does get a lot more complicated. But the pledge we, we've made is a universal one. And not only does it help people, it actually uh, reduces uh, inflation. Um, most of the, uh, you, you know, earlier, people forget this, but there were predictions of inflation running at 18% next year. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And that was all, the reason that those numbers were so high was because of energy prices. Um, you know, the, 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 we, I, I know um, if you look across Europe, I mean, in, in the Netherlands, the, I think the last inflation figure was 17%. 17.7%. 17. Yeah, percent. shocking. And that, again, was to do with, with energy prices. You know, Germany, for the first time, had inflation at 10%. Um, and, and the energy intervention critically helped, uh, is helping people, consumers. It's helping businesses. But it's also helping getting that headline uh, CPI inflation rate down as well. So for those three reasons, I think it was absolutely necessary. And obviously you're in an unenviable position. We, we don't know when energy prices might revert to normal. No. We don't know what's going to happen in Ukraine. This is an exogenous sure. event That's that right. isn't within your, right. your control. So it, it's difficult so to price of, the commitment. Yeah, right? but it's, and it's really I important to remember. I think we estimated it as anywhere between 60 billion and 220 billion, but I'm not blaming you for the width of yeah, those numbers. numbers yeah, yeah. Uh, but it, it's really extraordinary because the, the numbers that we're looking at were all about... Um, as you say, exogenous effects. COVID was exo exogenous. Yep. No one had heard of that before March 2020. And it totally changed everyone's life. Everyone in this room uh, had a life that was affected by COVID. We all, we all did. And then, of course, the energy uh, uh, price started going up in 2021. But, of course, it was exacerbated by Putin's invasion of Ukraine, which, again, was an exogenous uh, shock. I mean, I was speaking to people who were analysts, who were investors, who were business people. And they were assuring me that Putin was never going to invade Ukraine. It was a bluff, and it wasn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. But it did happen, and it's had massive effect on the energy world, the energy prices. You know, you look at Germany, uh, you look at uh, Europe, you look at where yeah. we are. We've all had to deal with this. And we, we obviously just don't know how this will pan out no, either, right? So, I mean, it, so we don't know how it will pan out. You know, we hope for the best, but I guess prepare for the worst. I want to come back to these investment zones ideas. This, this was, uh, I was intrigued to hear this, that the way you've sort of sketched them out in the, in the mini budget. Tell us a little bit about how this is going to work. So, uh, you know, which areas will be selected? What sort of deregulation could they apply well, the, for the, or the, go the, for? What's, the, what's the measures were in the the measures were in the in my in my speech and also in my speech yesterday. My, and I said that you know that, 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 that we're going to look at uh, tax. There'll be tax uh, measures, tax incentives uh, for those uh, uh, businesses located in the investment yeah. zones. There'll be simpler, easier planning. And, of course, we've got to emphasise that this is a mutual agreement. It's not saying, oh, well, we're going to... Yeah, you're not imposing... No, 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 no. no. But that's centre. really important yeah, that yeah. people understand that, that the, the investment zones are things that people will actually want in those areas or, the, you know, that the, the, the community has to yeah. be signed up to. It's not something that we're just imposing willy-nilly. And I think the idea there is to get, is to get growth going in, in areas that, that, that want to go down that, that route. And actually, what's interesting to me is that lots of areas are now expressing interest uh, in the investment zones. They don't speak to me directly, they speak to the uh, DLUC Secretary of State, uh, Simon Clark, yep. uh, and he's having lots of conversations with areas uh, around the country uh, who, which are interested in expressing interest uh, in the investment zones. And are you sort of hoping this might be a sort of proof of concept? Obviously, the, the standard slightly flippant criticism, but it's one I'll make anyway, is I want one investment zone it to be called the United Kingdom, but I appreciate you've got to deal with the politics of which what different local communities might want where. But do you think, is your aspiration, that as these roll out, 
the lighter touch regulation, the lower tax is proved to be successful. Other areas say, I want what they're having, and it becomes a domino effect across the country. Yeah, it could do. Start. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to prejudge that, but I do feel that it is an exciting, uh, an exciting development. And actually, the levels of interest that I'm hearing suggest to me that, that it, it can work. 2.5% growth, uh, that would get us back to the kind of pre-banking crash, long-term growth rates. And, you know, had we only had those for the last 15 years, an awful lot of the problems that are in your interest right. would have been mitig mitigated, the huge problems that are built up on, on death and deficit. Roughly terms, why 2.5%? I mean, look, whatever you do that I approve, I'm, I'm going to say you're not being ambitious enough I know to you go further that. and faster, you right? Why not 3%, that. why not 4%? Well, well, that's why you're in the beauty of the uh, beautiful world. I've got the easier case. job than you. Um, I do not deny it. Yeah. And I, Look, I, I think 2.5% is a good target to try, because I think it's achievable. And as you say, if you can sustain that, uh, it's, it's, as I said in my speech yesterday, it's something that we've done it before. We did it before... Uh, for about 30 years before, well, 25 years before 2008. And again, that was uh, achieved, I think, largely through the 80s reforms in terms of redu reducing uh, tax and supply-side benefits. Um, and I think that's something that we can, we can aspire to um, in, 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 in going forward. And uh, uh, the, in, some criticism has been made, and the new government has been robustly committed to an independent central bank. You've been absolutely ambiguous about that. Absolutely, about that. There, there's about been that. absolutely uh, no uh, question over that. Some economists are, are worrying that kind of while you're f there's some fiscal loosening on the one hand by the mm. Treasury and some tightening on the other from interest rates, are these just sort of going to cancel each other out? Do we have the two big no, institutions? Put us, put us at ease that they're, that they're not. So, 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 I mean, this is happening all over the world, okay? So the Federal Reserve has given a very strong signal that they're going to increase uh, interest rates. Yeah. And a lot of the, what we and saw in the market, are, and they are, and the, yeah. the, the dollar strength, uh, the Treasury uh, uh, sell-offs uh, last week in terms of the 10-year, all of those were an indication that that's what they're doing. And at the same time, President Biden is doing... Uh, his uh, Inflation Reduction Act, yeah, yeah. which is an act of fiscal expansion. Yeah. And the difference is, is that the fiscal expansion that we announced was tax cuts, and the fiscal announcement that he's it's announcing public spending. is public spending. But nobody's saying that his policies are acting against what the Fed are doing. Yeah, public spending never seems to be unfunded. It's only tax yeah, yeah. cuts, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so when, when, when he uh, does fiscal loosening and the Fed whacks up interest rates... No, there's, there's, no one has an issue with that. Yeah, yeah. But when, when we have a bit of fiscal loosening, um, and, and it's not, and you know, we're going to we're going to fund it. I mean, we were talking about spending, and we, we you know we, we talked about that. But but and every country is doing this. No country is now uh, raising taxes. I mean, that was the point I was making. Yeah. Uh, none of the G7 are raising taxes, but they're all putting up interest rates. So so and and the the monetary policy, as you know, classically deals with inflation. Yeah. And the fiscal uh, loosening, the fiscal um, expansion that we've seen has dealt with these exogenous shocks. So when the German government spends 200 billion euros on an energy bailout, that's, expan that's fiscal expansion. They're using balance sheet, but they're dealing with this, what you would call, what economists would call an exogenous shock. The ECB is still putting up rates. Sure. So this, you know, this is happening all over the world. I want to finish with a much longer term issue for you. Appreciate the new government's come in, and you particularly on the energy issue. You know, it, it's been necessary crisis management, right? Yeah. There is an absolutely urgent issue now, and I, and I, I feel for you in, in having to uh, address that. But let's, let's assume things come good. Uh, and, you know, there's two years to the election. Let's assume that your party is re-elected. What sort of vision do you have for the United Kingdom, not so much at the end of this parliament, but the end of the next one? If we look sort of seven years ahead, where I should we I be? I would really want to be judged on growth. Um, I really want to see a dynamic, uh, brilliant country, which we are. But I want to see growth at serious levels, and I want to see growth at good levels so that for public services and also opportunity. You know, when there's growth, young people have more opportunities than when there's less growth. Um, and I think there's a, there's a huge prize, actually, to be won. Um, and I think some of the reforms, we've done it, we've done it before. Um, and I think we can do this again. Uh, and I'm very, very focused on, on doing that.
I'm going to take some questions from the audience. I, don't, I think we've got a roving microphone here. Let me uh, take the lady at the back first, then I'll come to some of the press at the front. If you could introduce yourself. I'm going to take three and then come back to you. And I should just say, you know, I appreciate that, especially the media are likely to want to ask about politics. You can do that on your dime. I'm interested in the economic thinking here okay, rather okay. than the political thinking. So feel free to ignore political questions, Quasi, if you want to. Let's see if it's a pass or fail on question one. I have a feeling I'm going to fail. I'm very sorry. Um, Noah Hoffman from The Sun. Quasi, I was wondering if you could respond to your colleague Suella Braveman saying that the 45p tax cut U-turn was the result of a coup um, among your own MPs and also if you could respond to some MPs who are privately plotting your downfall already. Let me come to the front. You're going to be more likely to be answered if you ask a question about economics, I think. Um, at the front, just here. Again, if you can introduce yourself. Hi, uh, Tony Zyver from the Daily Telegraph. Um, I, I wonder if you would just comment on some of the, uh, some, again, some of your colleagues have been talking about uh, the possibility of benefits being uprated in line with inflation versus in, in line with wages. Um, I realise that is obviously a policy question, but perhaps you could give us an insight into your thinking about, you, you did talk uh, earlier about protecting the most vulnerable and, and the government's thinking around that. I mean, clearly, as inflation continues to, to increase, that's a concern for many people. And Carol. Well, as Tony has asked the first part of my question, if you have uh, senior members of the cabinet already making it clear what they think should happen to benefits, does that make it difficult for you when it comes to looking in the round and don't you need to come out and say whether or, you're, or not you're going to increase benefits in line with inflation? So yeah, I wonder if I can package those together, but I think the Prime Minister this afternoon's made plain that you know over the longer run, top marginal rates might come down. It's just not a for now issue. I wonder if you could give me some help, Quasi, on this benefits question, because I, I've been asked this on a number of radio and television interviews, and obviously in your mind's eye, when somebody thinks about benefits, you immediately think about kind of desperate assistance to the poorest. But I mean, there are benefits right across the income spectrum, right? You could potentially protect those, uh, you know, in the lower poorer cohorts and perhaps not take the same view of benefits that are being, you know, I'm not trying to pigeon you, you know, back you into a corner. But I mean, there's such an array of them that, you know, some might be treated in one way and some in another. Is that a fair thing to say? And am I right on the top marginal rates? John asked you about other high marginal rates in the system, you know, that, that that's still something over the longer term that you want to look at. So look, we're going to have a tax review to look at the, the cliff edges that you talked about. In terms of the 45p rate, I mean, I was speaking to a lot of colleagues, and the problem with the 45p rate, as I've said uh, in my morning round yesterday, was that it was a huge distraction. Yeah. You know, we spent 40 minutes talking about... It's a very, a very small hour. part of the yeah, overall... Yeah, half an hour about, about investment right. zones, about not reversing mm -hmm. the national insurance uh, increase. We've talked about... Uh, bringing forward the, the 1p cuts in the basic rate, all of these things people are welcoming. And then the 45p issue was just drowning out uh, too much of what was, a very, I think, a very strong package. So that was uh, a, a decision that the Prime Minister and I, uh, and I took, and I think it was the right one. I think a lot of colleagues uh, came to me and WhatsApp me and said, this is exactly uh, wh where we should be. I'm not going to get drawn into uh, a debate about what we're going to uh, do on, 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 uh, on the benefits. Clearly, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the DWP Secretary of State uh, is looking, is reviewing uh, what, what the, the policy is uh, on that. We're having conversations. Uh, and actually, I was making a broad point about, you know, humane society. We, you know, compassionate conservatism, I thought, was a good phrase. And it's something that I always think about uh, I think, in, yeah. in terms of policy. I mean, I think we've got to, we do have a duty as uh, to look after very vulnerable people. I mean, that's, that's what we do. And I think it's true to actually say, I, I think I've got this right, for, for better or for worse, the energy package is the single biggest benefits package announced by any government ever, isn't it's it? The, yeah. In terms of the British government, this is one of the biggest interventions we've made to protect uh, people. And that's why we're going for growth. I mean, in recessions, it's not rich people who suffer. When the economy isn't growing, it's not the rich who are suffering, it's people on lower incomes whose uh, opportunities shrink. That's why, to me, going for growth and trying to expand this economy is, is a moral duty. Let me come back to the audience. Let's go, go a little bit to the, to the back. The gentleman there right at the back with glasses, if you can introduce yourself. Again, I'll take three. Then the, the gentleman there, so bearded gentleman there, if you can introduce yourself, and then I'll come back up to the front. 
um, Salok from uh, Watford constituency. Uh, two, quest um, two related questions. Your biggest um, tax, um, sorry, the uh, be um, spending is on energy. Now, uh, the regulator who uh, is, uh, appears to be taking the highest price, which is gas, to regulate the whole of the energy market, when are you actually going to look at the actual cost of energy and reducing the unit cost rather than that? And secondly, um, you know, who is going to be sacked in that uh, department uh, for regulation when they've allowed so many uh, companies who are, shouldn't be in business to be uh, supplying our gas, uh, increasing the cost to them, us? Well, look, let, I mean, let, let me say sorry. three quads, if that's right. Then, uh, yeah, just a few steps forward, here, sort of in the middle, forward, 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 forward towards me. That's towards me, about three rows towards me. Gentleman there, yeah. Th thank you very much. Uh, my name is James. I'm just here in a, in a personal capacity. Chancellor, I hear you talking about growth, and, and clearly that is a priority for the government. Um, just about every country in the world wants to grow its economy. Uh, so, therefore, Britain is competing within a global economy. So, I wonder if you could just maybe speak about a little bit about uh, the competitiveness, competitiveness of Britain and what you will do and what the government will do to improve that competitiveness and thus grow the economy within a very competitive global economy. Thank and you. And then let me come right down to the front here. Hi, it's Ione Wells from BBC. You've talked about the word compassionate a lot. Just personally, do you think it would be the compassionate thing to do to raise benefits in line with inflation? I'm, I'm not going to get drawn into that policy debate. You can't really have a different personal position to a political yeah, position, so, really. So, yeah. so, so that's just... Um, that's what I'll deal with that. So the first question on the sort of decoupling the prices, is the so price mechanism back. working so, yeah, yeah, efficiently? So, so can I talk about competitiveness? Yeah, please do. Yeah. That's absolutely critically important. That's why I was very interested in trying to incentivize investment in this country. I mean, investment zones is part of that. You speak to investors around the world. They want to invest in investment zones. They want to invest in a lot of our net zero uh, ambitions. You know, uh, offshore wind is attracting huge amounts of capital. Uh, we're, we're striking a, a nuclear deal on the verge of a nuclear deal uh, with uh, EDF and, and France. You know, Britain has to be a hub for uh, investment. Um, and that's why we've got to look at our, at our tax system as well to attract people to come to the UK. And that's very much, I mean, you, you would have seen the growth plan. There's a lot in there that is, that is, that is, that is focused on that. On energy, I mean, I was uh, energy secretary for nearly two years. And you're quite right. I mean, we've got a system where the gas, the marginal uh, cost of, uh, of gas essentially is driving uh, the, the cost of electricity. And that comes from a system where we had essentially a coal and gas driven yeah. electricity system. And now we're moving away from that where we have much more renewables on the far more renewables on the grid, both offshore, some onshore. We've still obviously got uh, base load in terms of nuclear. And, and, and actually, that's why we launched, I think, just in June or July, um, the um, electri uh, REMA, the Retail Electricity Market, uh, a review on how we price uh, electricity. So these things are really, really uh, key questions. And actually, lots of people across Europe are dealing with this very conundrum. Because you've got a, we've got an electricity uh, price mechanism which is driven by gas, but increasingly it's not gas which is driving electricity production. It's a whole range of other uh, power sources. So how we solve that is very is very important. About your point about Ofgem, I think I think Ofgem do a really good job actually. I think it was unfortunate that we were in a situation where we had uh, the price cap, and a lot of companies, um, you know, were sent, essentially caught out because the difference between the wholesale price and the price cap meant that, and they hadn't hedged their positions, meant that they, they, they weren't financially viable. But actually the system was quite tensile. We had um, a supply of last resort. Uh, we, people were moved on from some suppliers to others uh, quite effectively. And even though in terms of the regulation, lots of companies didn't have the financial resilience to withstand, the system as a whole meant that um, a lot of the, the disruption in the market wasn't even noticed because people were shifted mm -hmm. uh, to other suppliers. And then, obviously, coming into this winter, we had the problem with the absolute price, and the government has intervened in a robust way, uh, as we've talked about. Let me come back for a few more, more questions at the front here. You go, let me take two at the front here, and then Morgan behind you. Thank you. Uh, Hugo Jai from the iNewspaper. Chancellor, when do you expect your growth plan will start producing growth? Clearly, a lot of 
uh, a lot of voters and the markets have lost faith in the government's economic credibility. When would you say to them, look, it's working? When do you hope that moment will be? And then uh, three along to your right. Thank you. Hi, it's uh, Joe Mays from Bloomberg. Um, the market expectation is the Bank of England will have rates up near 5% next year, and that's largely driven by rate hikes from the Federal Reserve. And I'm wondering, to what extent do you see that as a structural headwind you'll have to push against to promote growth when households will have higher mortgage costs, companies will have higher debt costs, less money to invest in R&D? How much of an issue is that going to be? And then behind you on the second row, if you can pass over to Morgan. Uh, thank you, Morgan Schallemeyer from the Adam Smith Institute. Um, will you be re revisiting our commitment to the OECD Global Minimum Corporation Tax, especially as it seems antithetical to uh, investment zones and free ports, and also as the U.S. changes their position um, on Pillars 1 and 2, will we be you know, disadvantaging ourselves uh, for the sake of this commitment? Well, so just to remind you, quite so yeah, when, when are we going to see the results? Sure. Especially, this, this is a real frustrating thing, I guess, for supply-side reformers, because it takes time. It you does. have to make you know, decisions but that you know are not going to have an immediate impact, but are nevertheless going to be for the long-term good. There can be immediate impacts. I mean, in the investment zones, you know, some of these projects are going to be happening very uh, Almost soon, and I think you're going to see progress uh, very uh, quickly, I hope so. You know, when we, in the summer, people were talking about, you know, slowdowns, people even were talking about the art, you know, recession, all yeah. of those sorts of things. And I wanted to inject positivity in this. And yes, they're, they're, you know, people are uh, interested in the growth plan. There are some concerns about it. But I think the focus on growth has to be the right thing. And I don't believe that this, the path we were on was sustainable. I don't believe that simply by spending more and taxing more, we were, we were going we to make uh, significant progress. And we've, we've, we, we've reset uh, the dial on that in many ways. I think interest rates uh, obviously are... Um, uh, an issue, um, and it's a global issue. You're, it's, you're, it's, it was good of you to mention the Fed and mention the fact that there was, this is a global uh, situation. But that's why we had the growth plan and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the tax cuts, because you, you could imagine a world where interest rates were going and we were putting up taxes even further. That wasn't sustainable. Um, but obviously we're watching what's going on uh, and the then on the OECD thing, I mean, if, if, if private companies got together to fix a price, we'd call it a cartel. Uh, why should governments get together to fix tax, which is a price? Uh, you're all in favour of competitive, so I, I want you to undercut the other guys. Well, That's what the, well, in terms of the corporation tax, I mean, that was one of the reasons, you know, a big commitment we made was to undo the, the increase. I mean, this was going to hike from 19 to 25. And people said to me, oh, well, 25, that's the same as France. I mean, what's wrong with that? <laughs> well, um, and I said, you know, well, I don't want to be the same as France. I want to have a lower, more competitive rate uh, than, than them. So that was a, a really uh, strong commitment um, and was, was, was something that we were very committed to in the growth plan. And so do you have a scepticism about these global standards that, you know, all of the major Western, all the OECD countries agree X, I mean, whether it be for corporations. I want you competing with France. And, you know, that, that's, that's part of a, you know, part of a successful competitive <laughs> global economy, right? Um, but, 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 and we are. And that's why um, some of the measures we took are, you know, reversed, uh, mooted uh, increases in, in things like corporation tax. And are you nervous about OECD standards or G7 standards? That's the last government went down that pathway to some degree. I've, we've got to look at what the, 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 the standards are. I mean, obviously, we're always open. But I think, you know, setting tax is an important mark of sovereignty. OK. I think we've got time, perhaps, for three more questions. Let me come to the front here, and then I'm going to go to the back of the room. So I can start here. That would be great. Hi, Jess Elgott from The Guardian. Um, what do you make of what some of your ministers have been saying, that getting investment into the country is difficult when the polls are so bad, so that fracking companies aren't going to start drilling because in two years' time there's likely to be a Labour government who are going to ban fracking? OK, uh, let's, go to the, let's go to the lady at the back there. I think it's the back row sitting down there on the far side. Yeah, that would be great if you can introduce yourself. Um, Megan Kenyon from the Local Government Chronicle. Um, Chancellor, in, when the Prime Minister was, during her leadership campaign, she said that she would do a new spending review for this year, but you have since said that that's not going to happen, you said in your talk just then. Um, I wondered if there's a reason behind that, because the, the in spending review packet we're going off, um, since it was set, inflation has risen more than was expected, so I wondered why there was a reason that that has been 
decided not to go ahead. And then just behind you, yeah, gentleman with the scarf on there. Yeah, just that, that's right. Uh, Chancellor uh, Marwan, speaking in a personal capacity, um, <clears throat> why do you think the Bank of England have allowed base rates to be so low for so long? It's a really good question. It's not on the first one. Uh, I mean, quite a challenge for you, Kwasi, to get, if you wouldn't mind giving the market some absolute certainty about the outcome of the next general election, I'm sure yeah, that yeah. would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, I mean, th I mean that, that was an extraordinary question. I mean, you know, I've seen, I mean, polls do move up and uh, up and down. I mean, uh, in the last six years, I've seen, you know, we got 9% in the, in the uh, Euro election uh, in 2019. Uh, I think we were at 17% at, at, at that point. Uh, this time last year in conference, we were, what, five or six points behind, and Boris was going to be there for 10 years. Um, things go up and down. Um, what we need to do is focus on actually delivery, good results. Two years is an eternity in modern politics. And I think if, we, if, the, if the growth plan delivers, we, we're going to be in a competitive place. I always say we're going to be... I never, say, I never predict victory, because that's hubris. But I do think we can be very competitive and have a, a compelling story to tell. Um, in terms of... Spending review was... Uh, the, the spending review, uh, the CSR, I think we've got to stick to uh, the 21. I mean, these things take ever. I mean, the Secretary of State, it does take a very, very long time. And I'm saying, look, let's stick to what we've said we, we're going to do. And actually, the, the, in terms of the inflation point, the government doesn't buy the government uh, the basket of goods of the CPI. You know, it's not as if the government goes into Sainsbury's and buys, sure. you know, a whole bunch of uh, shopping. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not, it's, it's slightly different. But I think it's a good, uh, a good uh, discipline to stick to, to what we, we, we said we were. Th that settlement took months. I mean, I was part of that. I was looking at that. I think we, we finally got it in October. And it started in June. The process started in May or June. And I don't want to go through another process yeah, reopening the, uh, the, the CSR. And then can I just press on the, the low interest rates question? I mean, again, yeah. we, I know the government has to be unambiguously clear about the independence of the central yeah. bank. But I've been just sort of frustrated bearing witness to this. I mean, the, the, the Bank of England's got one golf club in its, in its golf set, and it seemed unbelievably reluctant to swing it at all. Uh, and it's very clear what the target is, and they've got one lever to pull. Why, it's just bizarre this hasn't been pulled early. I mean, why, why are they taking in considerations which should rightly be those of the government, not those of the central bank? No, we have an independent bank. We have an independent bank. And I'll say this about the independent bank. I mean, I've been Chancellor for a month or four weeks, and I speak to Andrew Bailey on a regular, regular basis. And I think, he's a, I think he's a very fine governor. I think he's, a, he's, he's someone who understands history, he understands economics, he's very measured. And I think we've got to let him do his job. Hindsight is a beautiful thing. Um, you know, it's always very easy to say, well, they could have done this, they could have done that. But I think uh, what I want to do is to empower him to do his job and work closely with him, and as we have done in the last uh, week or so, to show that we are united and that we are focused on, on, on bringing a measure of stability. I'm going to finish with uh, what I hope is an upbeat question from the, from the chair, Kwasi. Obviously, it's been a difficult uh, last day or two for the government. And we know, you know, whatever you do, unless you truly are a miracle worker, these are going to be a difficult few months ahead. Yeah. There's no way out of that at all. But can you give us a bit of optimism? Why, you know, by the time we get to, it's difficult to put an exact date on it, I don't know, next spring, this time next year, why should we be confident that things will be rosier? And I'm not blaming this on the government at all, but it sometimes does feel that the world is in a permanent spiral of crisis at the moment, yeah, if mean, it's not one thing or another. What will, are you genuinely, are you just sort of crisis managing? Or are you genuinely right. confident that this time next year we'll, if not be punching the air, at least feel a little less think, gloomy think, than we are I today? I think we've had two extreme events in the last two and a half years. We've had COVID, we've had the energy uh, price spike that came out of COVID, and then we had the Russian war. The, uh, and all of these things have created a level of uh, uncertainty. And mutually reinforced. And reinforcing, you know, supply chain constraints. I think there's a world in which we can be in a very strong position uh, next year. And, I'm, and that's what I'm working to. That's what I'm building uh, towards. And I remember, if you look at the last four conferences, they were all incredibly different. I mean, 2019, there was all the, the hullabaloo about the prorogation. Uh, 2020, we were in the depths of COVID, but we hadn't got the, the vaccine rollout. 2021, things were looking very, very different. And now, each of those years, and if you looked at the polls at each of those times, they were very, very different. Yeah. Um, and I think that um, you know, we, can, we can actually deal with these problems. And I think if we get growth uh, back, I think we'll be very, very competitive. 
Life has been a roller coaster. It's it has. I mean, I, you know, I've been in Parliament for 12 years, and I look between 2010 and 2016, um, and 2016, since 2016, lots and lots of things have happened that weren't meant to happen, that people said they wouldn't happen. Uh, you know, we had Brexit, we had the 2017 election. Do you remember the 2017 election? We were 20 points ahead when that was called, and I remember it vividly. That changed in about, yeah, three weeks. It was weeks. the 18th of, three the 18th of April. April. Yeah. We, were, we, on the, we, were, we were on 45%. And Labour were on top. It was going to be a majority of 200 or something. That's right, it was 160. If you've read into the. And that was. And that changed in six weeks, seven weeks. Mm -hmm. The 18th of April, I remember the election was called. And then on June the 8th, uh, when the election happened, the, the, the lead was four points or three, right. two, two points, three points, whatever. It was, it, it was a huge swing, okay? And I think that we are living in a world where. The, the swings are getting bigger as well. You yeah. didn't get these sort of swings 25 years ago. No, you probably wouldn't. Much. And, and, it, and it is volatile, and, and there's lots of things out there that are challenging. But I think we, you know, if we have calm, steady nerves and, and stick to our plan and can deliver, crucially deliver the plan, I think, I think again, I think we'll be, we'll be in a strong place. Uh, thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for being with us. Thank you, Quasi. To close off Think Tank, uh, I was hoping we'd save the best for us. Please welcome back John O'Connell. Some very quick words of thanks for me for the Chancellor. Um, thank you for your time today. And if nothing else, at least it's um, exciting to be thinking, discussing, debating ways to boost otherwise anemic rates of economic growth. So that's encouraging for us in the think tank world, at least. Um, thank you to all of you as well for joining us at one point or another during think tank, making it the success it is. Um, thank you to the staff at the ICC in particular for all of your help in putting um, all of these wonderful events together. Thank you to the staff at the TPA and the IEA too. And I hope to see you all next year when I think ten, turns 10, Mark. 10th ten, anniversary. There next we go. Year. So we'll see you next year for the 10th anniversary. And most of all, uh, thanks for giving up a full hour of your time, Chancellor. Please give it up for Quasi Quartank. <laughs>